You're tuned in to Oilers Nation every day with Tyler Uramchuk. Live every weekday on the Nation Network YouTube. Can't stop, won't stop. Six in a row for the Edmonton Oilers. First place in the Pacific Division is right there. How does this streak change their deadline plans? There's so much to get to. Oh, Zach's here, by the way. What's going on? Let's get into it with the lead. The Oilers roll into Vancouver and roll over the Vancouver Canucks in the process. A 4-2 victory for Edmonton. Maybe I shouldn't say roll over. Maybe that game was a little bit tighter than I'm giving uh, the Canucks credit for. Shots were dead even, 29 apiece. But Zach Hyman proves to be one of the big difference makers. He scores, he adds three assists, finishing the game with four points. Ryan Nugent Hopkins, Leon Dreisaitl, and some guy named Connor McDavid. Uh, for McDavid, that was his first goal of the season. But Edmonton leans on their superstars a little bit and walks away with a 4-2 win. Zach, they're just on a flat-out heater right now. There's no other way to put it. Yeah, they really are. I mean, you look at, I mean, I think really since the year rolled over in 2023, they've turned a mm. corner in their game. Uh, but I think, you know, this last six game winning streak has shown a lot, right? I mean, obviously you got the San Jose and Anaheim where it's like, okay, they should roll them over and they did roll them yep. over, which is good to see. The Oilers have played down to these teams in the past. Um, but to put together another four solid games against, you know, Seattle, Vegas, Tampa Bay, Vancouver, um, you got to like what you're seeing right now. Yeah, there was a lot to like in that game against the Canucks as well. Um, oh, there's so much to get to. We're going to save our three big things for Montana's for just a second and instead talk about what we saw at the end of that hockey game with Bruce Boudreaux. I mean, basically in tears on the bench, happy for an Oilers victory, but that was a rough scene with Bruce. Terrible. I mean, it is embarrassing, quite frankly. I can't believe the Vancouver Canucks operated this way through this whole process. Because you know that Rick Taka had a four-week out clause with mm -hmm. TNT. So they've known since at least Christmas time that this was the route that they're going. Why not cut bait with Bruce at that point in time, put an interim in, and just go from there? Instead, they go through this four-week gauntlet of negative media, negative press around them. Mm -hmm. And I mean, how can anybody want to play there right now? How could oh. any coach want to go there? Um, obviously, Taka is the guy right now, but it sounds like he only signed a two-year contract. Like, I don't understand what the whole plan is here uh for the canucks right now two i think it's two more seasons so he gets this right. year and two more and i think pierre lebron's reporting 2.85 million on the rick Tockett deal i couldn't believe it and then i mean for their gm patrick alvin to sit and address the media on sunday and say i made the decision this morning to let go of bruce it was like dude no what do you think we're <laughs> dumb like we all knew bruce knew yeah uh, how ridiculous Bruce Boudreaux was on Sirius XM today and was asked about his relationship with Jim Rutherford and said he'd rather not comment on that right now. Totally understandable considering everything that went down. Uh, but one of the game's kind of good, genuine guys as well as Bruce Boudreaux. So it just really messed up the way the Canucks did that. And then the messaging coming out of there. You have Rutherford, what, three, four, five weeks ago, whenever it was, he met with the media and said, we're not looking to rebuild. We're looking to retool. And then Patrick Alvin yesterday says, it's not going to be a quick fix. Cape, that sounds like a rebuild, my guy. Um, I just, I don't understand the direction they're going. Well, it seems to, they all seem to be on different pages. Yeah. And I think that's the tough thing about it, right? Yeah, totally. Um, our pal Liam is in. Liam, good your afternoon. thoughts on the Canucks. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you're listening from. That's actually a good point. Yeah. We're a global show. We're Mr. Worldwide here mm -hmm. on Oilers Nation every day. My thoughts on the Vancouver Canucks. What a joke. On and off the ice. Um, <laughs> Mike Yo is your assistant coach. Experienced in the league. Literally, Minnesota. Did he coach anywhere mm -hmm. else? St. Louis for a little bit? Yeah, he's been guy? around. Yeah, like, why not just fire Bruce Boudreaux a month ago? End this whole thing about, like, the, you know, the drama that's honestly gone on around it. And also, like, give TNT a little bit of content, too. Your last month of Rick Tockett, they can ride it out there. Like, you can kind of get your fan base behind Rick Tockett a little bit. Instead of what it is now. And now, like, he's essentially public enemy number one. He hasn't done anything wrong. Well, like, yeah, he, he does this press job. He does this press conference, and there's, like, no hype about him. No one's even really asking him questions. They all just want to throw darts at Rutherford <laughs> and Alvin, which I would have, too, if I was in that press conference as a member of the Vancouver media. So yeah. it, a really, really weird thing out in Vancouver. Um, you know, sorry, Tyler, just the end of that game was crazy. Just to see like a coach stand there knowing full well what's yeah. about to happen and just like absorb it all. Like 
it was, it was like here it is now it's kind of it just gives you goosebumps doesn't it thinking about it and and then these 10 minute press conference that i i was i was watching it and i was saying to my girlfriend i was like this is on their like the vancouver canucks account yeah. and he's talking about how he's getting fired tomorrow like this whole situation is absolutely insane like hopefully we just never ever see this again because it's, it's not fair to be honest in no sense no not at all i mean I think this scene on Saturday was just like you said, Liam, it was just wild to see it happen. Um, I know there were some reports that came out that a bunch of the players were like walking into his office afterwards and having some beers and like sharing like emotions and tears and stuff. I saw some people on Twitter saying that apparently some of the vets took Bruce out on the town Saturday night in Vancouver out for a couple of drinks or something like that. Right. Um, Like you said, Tyler, he's one of the good guys in the game. Yeah. Right. I mean, you hate to see anybody treated this way, um, but I think especially for a guy like Bruce, it, it makes it a little bit a little bit tougher, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, let's circle back. We are live on the Nation Network YouTube here. You get a quick look at the storied career of Bruce Boudreaux. We'll see if this is the end. I, I think I have a hard time seeing him getting another head coaching job. I could see him maybe getting on somewhere if he wanted to do some kind of behind-the-scenes sort of work consulting. But I don't know if he's a bench boss again. It's kind of like Ken Hitchcock with the Oilers yeah, right now, yeah. right? Good point. Like he just kind of sits down and... Wait, he lives in California, I think, right? Just I sucks up the sun and watches hockey every day. Like, yeah. you need guys like this in the game. They're very important to have. Yeah, absolutely. Career 626 uh, points percentage as a head coach. All right, Oilers Nation every day from the Sports Closet Studio, sportscloset.ca. I was there over the weekend. They have these the just real sharp all-star game jerseys, and they're getting in some McDavid's as well. So keep it locked, sportscloset.ca, or one of their three locations around the Edmonton area. Uh, the YouTube chat is fired up. We hit 8K subscribers on our YouTube, so hey, there you go. Maybe 10K by the end of the year. Who knows? Rusty the Reckless Optimist gets the first word today on the chat. He says, great weekend for everyone. Congrats to Zach Hyman for being named the NHL First Star of the Week. I didn't even know that happened. He's on pace for 96 points this season. Rusty adds, I'm so glad he plays for the Oilers. Yeah, man. I mean, it's easy to get behind a guy like Zach Hyman. There you go. One of the, or the first star of the week. That was a guy, Zach, when they signed him, a lot of Ken Holland detractors were like, oh, it's seven years for this guy. But you're in win now mode. You don't get free agents like that if you don't pay something. Yep. That's a great contract. Like this guy on pace for 96 points at nearly the 50 game mark of the season. It's not like this is the 20 game mark anymore. And the Oilers got him for five point whatever million. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's a great contract. It really is. I mean, even down the road, I don't think it's going to age too terribly either. I mean, I think Hyman's a guy who can still be an effective, mm-hmm. you know, third line depth guy down the road a couple of years. But I mean, the offensive production that he's had since he's joined Edmonton is tremendous, right? Like, let's not forget that, you know, in Toronto, there's a lot of very highly skilled guys too. Yeah. Like they got Austin Matthews, William Nylander, Mitch Marner. And for Hyman to come over here and be producing career numbers with another echelon of elite talent, um, it's really impressive. It really is. He's been everything and more, I think. Uh, that this organization needed. We'll have a little bit more on Zach Hyman in a second. Uh, also in the chat, our pal Tyler Mulek was in, um, and he said, talking about the Daryl Sutter thing, I promise we're going to get into some Oilers stuff at some point, but Daryl Sutter sitting there, and he was asked about Jacob Pelchier, for those of you who missed it, Flames Nation has the video up, and he basically pretends he doesn't know who Jacob Pelchier is. He is a Flames first-round pick who had just played his first NHL game. What did you make of that from Sutter? Some people are saying, ah, the media, everyone's making too big of a deal out of it. It was tongue-in-cheek. It was just Sutter being Sutter. Some people are, and I think rightfully going, it's a little bit of a lack of respect for a guy who just played his first game. Yeah, absolutely it is. I mean, I think it's ridiculous, quite frankly. Uh, I know people in Calgary are infatuated by Daryl Sutter and almost treat him like a god, but... I think stuff like that, there's there's really no room for it as far as I'm concerned. Like, what good does that do for anybody, right? Like, because if you're Jacob Pelche, you're sitting there, you're like, well, obviously you don't want your coach talking about you like that, right? Like, Pelche has been a good player. Like, he's been mm-hmm. down in the American League for two years, 34 points in 31 games this year so far with the Wranglers. I mean, there's a player there, yeah. right? He was a 2019 draft pick, same year as Philip Broberg. Broberg is a guy who's kind of getting his shot in the NHL right now. So, you know, Calgary clearly doesn't have the chops to be a playoff team this year i don't think i think it's very interesting the comments obviously like you wouldn't the last thing you would kind of expect but also the first thing but you would kind of hope sutter and peltier had had a more positive conversation behind the scenes but you'd hope so right? i would Maybe. assume that's just what happened um here if you haven't seen it we can play it right now i think aaron's got it queued up for us yeah there we go 
think of Peltier's debut? Uh, what's that? What did you think of Jacob's first few shifts in the NHL? Uh, Jacob Peltier. What number is he? 49. 49. <laughs> Six minutes, 35 seconds, 13 shifts, average 30 seconds a shift. Got 43 seconds in the power play, played five minutes, 52 seconds, had one shot and goal and one hit. Beyond the stats. What just from being on the bench and seeing what the veterans on the team are doing? It's the NHL. 21 years old. He's got a long ways to go. Well, he knew his age, but not his jersey number, I guess. Um, Which, ironically, are the same number. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Isn't he 20, what, play 21? No, I think uh, he's like 48 or 49. Yeah. Damn it. They cut that. <laughs> Got it. Wait, we're live. Um, like a dangerous way it says, has to be just trolling the media. And he was. If things were going well and Calgary's leading the Pacific Division and all of this, I would look at this and go, ah, he's having some fun. But there's been issues. He made the joke about Huberto that he was taking a shit even though Huberto was getting work done and he was hurt. Mm -hmm. That didn't go over well in the room. Frank Saravalli's reported that. That room at times this year has apparently been prickly, but the relationship has not been good. The relationship at least from my vantage point between Sutter and management in Calgary also is not good. And I think part of this was maybe him messing with the media. Sure. But another part of this, I think might've been sending a message to management because management's given them chances with these young players. They need scoring. They are not scoring nearly at the same clip. They were last year. They need goals. Management is calling up these young guys from the minors. They have the AHL's leading goal scorer, right? Connor Zary. Yeah. And Sutter is like, Peltier got in a game. He was healthy scratch just for 13 days in the NHL. He didn't play a game. Like, I think there's a there's problems in Calgary. Something's a little rotten down there. How about uh, Rhett Warner's comments the other day on Bomb Burner? Did you see that clip? Those were, that was such a good clip. That was a really, was really good, good point they made. He's just like, when is these veterans... Like, I'm kind of paraphrasing a bit, mm -hmm. but he basically said, like, when are these veterans just like, not enough? Yep. Like, basically, like, what do these rings even matter if you're not doing anything on the ice? And yeah, just in Calgary, there's so much friction down there right now like for honestly like since they got eliminated by the oilers like nothing has really gone up everything's gone downhill these stars are leaving these stars are showing up doing nothing i know they got a big win on the weekend against tampa bay but it's not going as well as it should be that's for sure no, it is not uh let's go back to the game against vancouver for the oilers because we do have to do our three big things courtesy of our friends at montana's their fantastic lineup of daily deals it's bringing back the viewing party that's what they're doing head to montana's.ca to check out the full lineup also their new comfort menu um you can see here oh there's the lineup. you don't even have to go to montana's.ca we got it for you half price wings today five dollar tacos tomorrow all you can eat ribs on wednesday unbelievable sunday Look at that. You don't want to leave your house? Boom. 15% off online takeout. Come watch the bills. Oh, Ooh. we're done. <laughs> <laughs> That's so mean. All right. Uh, my first big thing, Zach Hyman's monster night. I know we kind of touched on it already, but this guy is now up to 24 goals on the season. 56 points. I love the line that Chris Chalmers uses on the Real Life podcast. It's something where he kind of goes, you can't teach your kids to be Connor McDavid but you can always teach your kids to be Zach Hyman. What does he do well? Works hard, goes to the tough areas. He's the dream fit in this top six. And the big thing with him this year, knock on wood, is he's staying healthy. But if he does stay healthy, like he's going to be over a point a game guy this year. It's unbelievable. Yeah, it really is. And I mean, I think that work ethic is what this Oilers team needed, really. Yep. You know, we, we always think back to a guy like Ryan Smith in Edmonton. Mm -hmm. Zach Hyman has almost become that level of a player where every single shift, you know what you're going to get out of him. Right? He's going to go hard. He's going to play in the dirty areas. He's going to score garbage goals. Um, I Like I said before, like it's just this has been such a great signing for this team. Really one of the best, I think, that we've seen from this organization in a really long time. Didn't you write an article asking if it was the best? Or was that something that we discussed at one point? I think that's been a question that's out there. Like, is Zach Hyman the best free agent signing in Oilers history? Uh, like, maybe it's because what this is year two now, right? Year three. Three? It's yeah, three. Mm -hmm. three. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you got a pretty good sample size. I kind no, of it's year two. Many off the top of my head. Like, better than Lucic, so. One Miles better than Lucic. Yeah. <laughs> by, by this point in the Lucic contract, we were already trying to figure out how the hell to get out of it, right? Yeah, because like, really. he had the first good year, yeah. and at this point in year two of Lucic, things had really kind of hit the shits. So, yeah, to see Hyman, he's already three goals away from his total last year. And I think everyone considered last year a great success for Hyman. So, um, yeah, Zach Hyman, his monster night, four points. He gets our number one big thing. Number two, it's that Stu's all right. 
You know, I was maybe a little bit nervous about Skinner coming into this one just because he hadn't played in a long time, right? Played against LA on January 9th. Goalie has 12 days off. Birth of a child, obviously a big moment, an emotional moment. I was kind of like, oh man, he hasn't played in a while. What are we going to get here? Well, what we got is all-star caliber Stuart Skinner, 931 save percentage. He looks calm, collected, wildly confident in the pipes. The Oilers have two goalies humming along right now. Two goalies who are hot, a schedule that's soft. They can keep this thing going for a while, I think. How do you run it? Like, I know it's, like you said, like both goalies, like you can't play both. So you got to, it's a difficult decision to make. Yeah. But you have Columbus on Wednesday, right? Yeah. You give them, is that also two games before the break? You have Wednesday yeah. on, Columbus on Wednesday, Chicago on Saturday, then it's the break. So you give one to each. I would give yeah, I would Campbell, give, Columbus, Skinner, Chicago. I would give, I would do it the other way. Just because Skinner's been gone out of the lineup for 12 days. Now just get him in a little bit of rhythm because then he's gone again. Like maybe that's yeah. the way you kind of want to run it. I say you play them both at the same time. Why not? Why Two not? goalies and four skaters. Or game. do like a beer league team. One of them plays defense in one of the games. <laughs> who would you play? Campbell, who do you think would be the better defender? I, I think Skinner is the answer. Also, yeah. Ruskin, Skinner, I think he skates better, but he's played with a puck might not be as good as his play with the puck is a little bit concerning. I think yeah. Jack Campbell's got a little bit more of that Mike Smith in him from from the goaltender perspective. I think I would go with Campbell as a defenseman. Skinner, throw him on the fourth line. If you're running 11 and 7, give him some shifts with McDavid. Just make it work. Yeah. Yeah. Tyler Mulek says just switch him at halftime and like yeah. not even wait for a whistle no. on the fly. Uh, Either way, it's great that we are now joking about the Oilers goaltending because a month and a half ago, Jack Campbell's play was the only joke. Yeah, and he's yeah. turned it around. So, like the fact that they have both these guys and can just now roll, like it, it's a great feeling. It feels good. There's a lot, obviously, just tons of confidence flowing through this team right now. And even on Saturday, when things didn't look as promising as they as they started out to be, like you still had a lot of confidence in skinning between the pipes and just mm -hmm. overall team finishing out the game, which they did. They obviously got the goal disallowed, which was is what it is, I suppose. But mm -hmm. they found a way to to get it done at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, my third big thing from that game, it was a couple of seconds into that one where Connor McDavid made it one nothing, scoring his 40th of the season. It was a minute 26 in. He is the fastest player to 40 goals since Pavel Bure in, I believe, the 1999-2000 season. So basically the fastest player to 40 goals this century, which is remarkable. He is on pace for 68 goals. How many does he finish the year with? 69. That's what Gregor guessed today. Frank said, I think he will finish with 68. I'm going to be like, and we could see it. His best months every year are March and April. He gets better as the year goes on. The stats all back that up. We could see a push for 70. He he could do it. Like, I think the true answer is you can put a cap on it. Right? I, yeah. Like, I, like no he, cap. he's right. He's no cap. He's the best player in the world. I think there's no limitations to what he can do on the NHL ice. Um, I'm not one for like real hard predictions, but I think at the end of the day, 70 is absolutely within reach. Uh, yeah, it's so hard to say because who knows? Like the sky is the limit. Yeah, he could have three games in a row where he has nine goals. Yeah, nine each game. Yeah, twenty-seven but, goals in three games. Yes. but <laughs> yeah, like seventy. Can you imagine we see someone get seventy goals? It's not like the fact. Like, and this is not discounting it. Matthew's got sixty, and we were all like. That's a very, very impressive. Yeah. And, and because the one before that was Stamkos. And now we're talking about one season later, somebody scoring 70 goals. It's insane to even think about. So yeah, 70. Why not? May as well. Drop your predictions in the chat. Also hit a like button. Maybe we can hit 70 goals for the predicted or 70 likes for the predicted Connor McDavid, 70 goals. So if you're watching on the Nation Network YouTube, do us a solid hammer that like button. Avery. From every sports show is in. So funny seeing what Connor has done compared to the last 30 years than seeing what Mario Lemieux did while not at 100% health. Yeah, I mean, still totally different eras, but um, I, some of the stuff Mario did was also remarkable and probably doesn't get enough love from like casual hockey fans. Uh, but that's a whole other conversation. <laughs> uh, all right, those are three big things for Montana. Stu, Hyman, and Connor McDavid lead the Oilers to victory. So earlier on in the chat, okay. oh boy, Rusty. And I'll read it out because he's here every day. He was asking about an English paper he has to write about hockey. So he need, the question he has is, should fighting belong in hockey? And I think this is like, a, this is a quick topic, and it kind of works really well right now where the Oilers are at. I would say yes, because of what he's done to bring this team together in this last couple of weeks. Yeah. It's brought a positive impact. Granted, like, I think it's good that the sport has got away from like the stage fights where you have to have guys in the lineup who only fight. Mm -hmm. So 
the answer to your English paper, Rusty, is yes, hockey is good. Uh, hockey is good, but also fighting is good in hockey. Where I'll go with this is tying it into the Oilers' turnaround. And I actually have a piece up on the site right now, OilersNation.com, about this. And there are a lot of really good things about this turnaround in January. But one of them is this team is playing with more emotion. This team is sticking up for each other, which they weren't doing early in the season. This team's coming out of the gates, ready to play in the first period. And they're not afraid to drop the mitts. And I think those fights cost in on Maroon. You saw the reaction from Kane and Nurse in the penalty box. Even the reaction on McDavid when he gets back to the bench and is, you know, giving cost in a couple of head taps. Like, I think there's something to be said about, you're right, Liam, stage fights, that's dumb. It went away. It needed to. But these spur of the moment, I'm doing this to stand up for my teammate kind of tilts. I think they bring you closer together. And I do think there's a part of it. That's the reason they've turned it around. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think so too. I think there's absolutely a place for fighting in hockey. Um, As long as there's contact in hockey, I think there should be fighting, right? Because we see it happen where there's big hits, clean or not, um, and players have to answer the bell for it because of the, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the so to speak moral code that's around in the NHL, right? Um, I think you have to have it because you look at what Maroon did on Saturday or last week on Thursday, and I think it's a perfect example, right? He's taking runs at guys, and that's something that you can't do. Let, like taking runs at anybody is something that you can't do, so to speak, let alone going after a guy like McDavid, right? Yeah. Yeah, I think you need it, especially like Zach said, if there's going to be contact. Hungry Tyler's in the chat and says, in a sport where body contact is not only permitted but is expected, there will be players taking exceptions to how hard they were hit, how hard someone hit a teammate, et cetera. It's expected. Yeah, I think so. Um, Avery says, in the CHL, we don't need legal minors fighting. Yeah, I mean, sure. In junior hockey, they really have done a ton to yeah. push it out, especially like the OHL. I think David Branch was the guy who like put it in there. Like, I think if you fight twice, you get suspended now. And like, there's, there's a rule in the CJHL, which is junior A hockey across mm-hmm. Canada. At least it's up. But if you fight, you get ejected from the game. Mm-hmm. So essentially, just a limp. Like, you're still allowed to do it, but there's consequences to it. So nine times yeah. out of ten, you won't see anything until like the last 10 minutes of the game when if a game's getting blown out or whatever but yeah like i i kind of agree we don't need these kids yeah just punching each other in the face for <laughs> our own entertainment doesn't like, make sense. it doesn't really work that well um all right there is some trade talk that people want to get to in the chat so we're gonna handle that we're also gonna play a little fill in the blank for our friends at star mechanical been one of edmonton's top new home plumbing installers for the past 20 years their crews highly qualified feature over 50 plumber gas fitters 35 of which are red seal journeymen star and look at that 24 7 emergency service and all you got to do is ring 780-481-8873 Who's an oiler that's worn 73? Have the Oilers even had an 88 oh, before? Doesn't Dan? D. Doesn't, Vinny oh, yeah. is Winnie. Big Vinny go. D. Yeah. Vinny that's yeah. the only we one win. I can think of. Gavin, anything? 73, Gavin. Darren A. Who's 88? Have the Oilers had an 88? I'm yeah, to think. someone... Isn't someone on the team right now? 88? Broberg's 86. Yeah, Broberg's 86. It's close. I, I can look this up. I have the technology in front of me. Yeah. All right, we'll get an answer to that. Uh, or if someone in the chat has an answer to that. Maybe that'll work. Ah, Brandon Davidson. There you go. So if you need 24-7 emergency repair, call 780-481-Davidson-DeHarnay. It's easy to remember. (laughs) All right, Zach, the first question I got for you. The Oilers have a blank chance of winning the division. 60% chance. Greater than 60% chance. Liam, what do you say? Can you repeat the question? Sorry, I was looking. The The Oilers 88, Rob Shrimp. Oh, friend of the show. Yeah, Rob Shrimp. There you go. The Oilers have a blank percent chance of winning the division. I think they have a 100% chance of winning the division. Well, okay. <laughs> it's not like, quite how statistics work, but, but throw some money on that like, yeah. How much do I think they can yeah. win? Okay, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. So I 100% think they can win the division. Three points back of Vegas right now at the same amount of games played. Two points back of Seattle. Seattle's got two games in hand. I would give them like a 75% chance realistically of winning. The yeah. I think the odds are in their favor. Yeah. I think you guys are right on it. 60 to 75% chance. Like the way they're heating up, Vegas is wildly banged up again. Yeah. They might not get Mark Stone back for the rest of the regular season. Logan Thompson's coming back to earth and Aiden Hill is Aiden Hill at the end of the day. Like he's fine. I expect them to be in the market for a goalie actually heading into the deadline. Seattle. Listen, it's a great story, but, I, and I like their roster, 
I and I've been a fool for maybe saying this last month. I just still think there's a stretch coming where they lose eight of ten. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I sorry, you go ahead. Zach. No, I was just gonna say I agree. Like I'm, I'm really high on Seattle. I think they are as good as they they seem to be right now. I mean, you look at that right there. Only 14 regulation losses on the yeah. season. Like that's a really impressive yep. number. And even last year, I thought that defensively they were really strong. Their biggest issue last year was they just had no offense, right? Well, now they've got that. They got Andre Burakovsky, mm-hmm. Oliver Bjorkstrand. You know, they've got Matty Beniers taking a big step forward this season. I do think that they're a legitimate threat. I think Vegas will drop off. You know, LA, they're a team that I'm not entirely sold on either. Um, I still think that they have a lot of flaws in their roster. And I think if you look anywhere below where Edmonton is right now, you know, I, I don't see anybody like Calgary making a big push for the playoffs, right? No. I, I think out of the top four teams in the division in Seattle, LA, Vegas, and obviously Edmonton, yeah. LA would be the fourth team in that spot for me. Like I think those three, like Edmonton, I think they could do damage ahead of the deadline, though. Maybe, yeah. Like if they do that, sure. But like as we talk today, like the goaltending is kind of iffy. Like it's just weird how like mm-hmm. Felix Cole plays the guy now. Like this yeah. guy who I believe hadn't played more than three games on one NHL team before. This and now season. he's best friends with Will Ferrell. Well, Have you seen the, that? I wish I was best friends. I saw that the high five thing. Yeah, they do it like after every win when Farrell's in attendance. Copley goes over to the glass and high fives him. That must That's be, cool. That what a life. Really Will Farrell's cool. friend. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, Will Farrell. Good guy. I don't think he's enough, though, to get LA over the over the edge. No. Will Farrell? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or Phoenix Copley. Both of them. Yeah. It'll be interesting, man. I You know who I'm intrigued? Like, just again, trade deadline fodder. The Kings could maybe use a goalie still. I know Phoenix Copley is a great story, but do you really want to run with that guy? No. And they have some extra right defensemen, and there's been a little bit of speculation that maybe they'd consider dangling one of their right shot D-men on the trade market to get an asset and then improve their team elsewhere. Ottawa needs right shot D-men. I wonder if there's a deal of, not that this helps the Oilers at all, this would actively go against helping the Oilers, like Sean Walker for Cam Talbot. Todd McClellan's familiar with him. Yeah. Had a good relationship from their time in Edmonton. Um, Todd played the ever-loving wheels off of him, but yeah. still, they had a good run together. Ottawa needs D-men, specifically right shot. Talbot would be a bit of a rental. I know he's 35, but they want him for one playoff run, and that's it. That'd be an interesting kind of fit, in my opinion. I don't think that LA would care the age. Like, they won all those Stanley Cups with yeah. older players, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I think that's an interesting one. Yeah, like, their relationship's there already. Ottawa... Where are they at kind of I understand this now? They've fallen out quite a yeah, bit. Josh yeah. Norris is done for the year, like they're yeah. toast. Yeah, so they they're probably looking at next yeah. year being like, if we can get someone like Sean Walker to oh, come in God. and next year we make that push, like I think that makes a lot of sense for them. And uh do you know one name and I don't know his contract, but how is James Reimer just still in San Jose? Like, I just don't get that. Like how is he's a good goaltender? Yeah. He's the only goalie on Frank's trade targets list. Right, so like, what what is it going to take to get him out of San Jose? Like, I just don't understand. Don't they want to lose as many? I know they're losing a ton anyway, but he's definitely helping them win some. <laughs> yeah. So if I'm an if I'm a team that's looking for a goal, if I'm Vegas, this is a name I believe we spoke about too in the summer for Vegas. Like, how is James Ryan not there already? I just don't quite grasp that idea. I think he will get moved. They're probably just waiting a little bit for some team to get desperate, right? Like, can you imagine if Phoenix Copley went down with an injury for the LA Kings? Or if Logan Thompson got hurt? Like, how much more would those teams be willing to pay? I think you want to wait for the market to develop. Because you're going to get some for them, right? Uh, We are... Someone said we were almost at 190 live viewers. So we are cooking. There was 190 people in this... In the show at one point, like 30 seconds ago. Mm -hmm. So if you're in there, let's get a like for Will Ferrell. Sure, we're at 71 likes now. That's yeah. huge. Best Will Ferrell movie, everybody, really quick. Uh, man, I'm an Anchorman guy. Uh, okay. The Other Guys. Oh, that's an interesting yeah, choice. that is a good one. That's a good that's one. That's an interesting choice. I mean, the cast, unbelievable. Michael Keaton's in that movie, and all he does is make TLC references the whole time. It's fantastic. Step Brothers guy, through and through. Yeah, how could that's, you not be a yeah, Step Brothers that's guy? That's the classic yeah. for me. They're all so, good. So, Talladega Nights is a a great one. Yeah. That's a good There's so many. He had that one era where he's just like ripping them yeah. off every year. It's like, man, this is awesome. The Connor McDavid of comedy. All hits, no misses. There you have it. Um, all right. Keeping going on our fill in the blank. There are a bunch of things in the chat I want to get to as well. Uh, the Oilers first round pick has a blank percent chance of being traded. 100%. 100%. I'm in agreement too. You're in win now mode. And 
listen, I think there there are untouchables in the prospect pool, and there should be. I don't think you. I don't think there's a reason to move Philip Broberg. I think Holloway, Borgo, and Schaefer, you keep them, and you stash those guys away, and that's your cap relief coming through the minors in the next few years. But the bottom line is, if you have Broberg on your blue line, take a look at everything else that's kind of around there. Evan Bouchard is signed or is under team control and could be signed long term. Darnell Nurse is signed long term. Brett Kulak has three more years after this one. Cody CC has two more years after this one. So you have Nurse, CC, Kulak, Bouchard, and Broberg all here for the next two years plus. DeHarnay realistically could. Tyson Berry even has one more season. You have so many pieces on the blue line that you don't need to dangle Philip Broberg, in my opinion, to go get a ca- or a defenseman with term. Yep, I, I completely agree. I think this is one of our mailbag questions this week too, wasn't it? Like, yeah, I think it might have been. People ask like, what would it take for you to move a big name prospect and who would be the yeah. untouchables? Mine would be right now Holloway and Broberg. I think they can both help this team today, mm-hmm. which is very important. And they give you that cap relief, like you said. Yeah. I wouldn't move a Borgo or Schaefer for a Joel Edmondson. However, no. if someone came in and were like, we Patrick, I just saw Patrick Kane in his name. Just that caliber of player. You're like, if you want Patrick Kane, we need Reese Schaefer. I'd say sounds good. However, I also think we always yeah. have a very good like B list prospect pool. Petrov Savoy. Petrov Savoy. Lavoie's actually having a really good year. Tulio. Tulio. And there's one other guy I can't even think. Of. Honestly, like, what does James Hamlin kind of get? I don't think he's quite yeah. a B, but he's at least shown he can perform in the NHL. And like, so I think that helps him a lot. And honestly, like Olivier Rodrigue too. Like he's done a really coming. good season. So I think there's, there's pieces there within the organization, which Holland has done a good job of gathering mm-hmm. that you can then avoid having to move yeah. one of your big guns. So here's my idea behind this. I am willing to move Philip Broberg in a trade. Um, it has to be for a defenseman with term. Uh, Jacob Chikorin type obviously yeah, sure. is kind of the big name. Mm-hmm. But to play kind of devil's advocate, who do you take out of the defensive lineup right now? Because as you mentioned, all of these guys have term on their contracts. Yep. You can't take Philip Broberg out of the lineup right now. You can't take Evan Bouchard out because they're playing really well. You're not taking out anybody else in the top four. So then do you trade for a seventh defenseman and run 11 and seven? You know, think back to the Dmitry Kulikov deal for a couple, like a couple of years ago. I think that's the kind of guy you have to target on the back end and maybe try and make a little bit more of a splashy move up front because yep. I think it's tough to take any of these defensemen out of the lineup right now. Yeah. I think that's why the others are at two on the blue line. I think it's just going to take a, a Kulak or a Kulakov mm-hmm. kind of player to come in and kind of balance things out. But again, I'm just going to stick on my Max Domi horse and hopefully that one rides up here into Edmonton because I think he'd just be a great asset for this team. Yeah. Uh, where I was going with uh, the prospect thing too is – so up front, I mentioned all the D-men who have term. The forwards who are either RFA or have at least two more years on their deal. McDavid, Dreisaitl, Hyman, Nuge, Kane. That's the your core top six, you can call them, right? And then you have pieces like McLeod, team control. Kyler Yamamoto is still, you know, team control to an extent. I'm not really counting Pugliarvi or Fogel because I think one of them will be dealt or both of them will be dealt. But you also have Ryan McLeod, or sorry, I counted McLeod. So there's seven. You count Holloway in there. Then you have Borgo and Schaefer. The reason you part with the next couple of first-round picks is even if you bring guys into your system, there's really not anywhere for them to play. Like, we're seeing it with Holloway right now. There's not really a spot in the top nine for Holloway to play meaningful minutes. So why do you want to keep drafting guys when you could cash in, bring in? Yeah, sure, giving up a first for rentals isn't, like, always the best. But at this point, if you were to bring in more prospects... If you're a believer in Borgo and Schaefer and obviously Holloway, which they are, there's just nowhere for new prospects to break through. You have your B-level guys that you can use. Yep, sure. But like trading the first round pick is just, it's an absolute no-brainer to me. Yeah, I think so. And I think even these next crop of prospects too, they're kind of like the 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 fill-in-the-blank players, so Mm -hmm. to speak, right? Like they're the guys who can come in and be third or fourth line role players for the Oilers down the road. Mm -hmm. Like I think Tyler Tulio is a guy who might be a little bit underrated right now in the system. He's looked really good in Bakersfield this yeah. season. You know, a guy who can almost be like a Brad Marchand kind of type of mm-hmm. player, um, not to like that upper elite echelon, but he's a pest, he's a pest yeah. right? He yeah. can play a physical game. He can shoot the puck. Um, you know, those are the kind of guys who Oilers are going to need in that bottom six for the years to come. I, I think too, sorry, just to close out the point, yep. the Oilers need to show belief in themselves and their ability to draft players late. 
because it's it's working really well. You look at Michael Kesselring too right now. I believe he was like a sixth round pick for them. Yeah, and he was now a late one too. He's late, he has like almost ten goals this season as a defenseman. Yeah. Like they've got to show belief in themselves and Tyler Wright and his staff, which they've done. So I think it shouldn't be an issue at all to trade like first and even second round pick too. Like yeah. do what you got to do. The Oilers have their first and second round picks in each of the next two drafts. They have their third rounder this year. They moved their fourth rounder. I believe that was the Broussard deal um, that they traded it away in. Then they have their fifth, sixth, and seventh rounders. Next year, they don't have a third because of the Zach Cassian deal, but they again first, second, fourth, fifth, and sixth in next year's draft as well. So a lot of draft capital you could potentially move and also situations where you move Pugliarvi for a second. What do two second rounders get you at this year's deadline? You move Fogel for... Uh, who knows if anyone gives you anything, but he's playing good right now. Maybe he develops some sort of trade value. Even in the summer, you could look at moving a Tyson Berry for a second rounder. Like his value will probably be pretty high this offseason as well. Um, a lot of ways to kind of restock that draft capital too, but they need to be considering moving the first round pick. Uh, there were a couple of comments in the chat I wanted to get to, but now I'm struggling to find them here. TC has this one. It's not trade related, but unpopular opinion. I'd rather finish second and play one of LA or Seattle than finish first and risk playing the abs. It's a decent point. You could win the division and play Colorado in round one, which seems wildly unfair. Yeah, that would be a horrible matchup for anybody. I think the abs will sneak into the top three of the division, but just on top of that, I wouldn't really want to play any of the teams from the Central Division right now. Like, oh. they're all three of those teams above. What is it? Dallas, Winnipeg, and what's the other team I'm missing? Dallas, Winnipeg, Minnesota, Colorado. Yeah. So, I mean, none of those teams are really exciting to go up against in the first mm-hmm. round. Like, they're tough teams. So, yeah, that's, it's not a bad point. Get home ice advantage. And then who knows? Maybe if it is Colorado, they knock off whoever the top seed is in our division and we get home ice advantage in the second round, too. So. Yeah. Never know. But also, I would just say, don't even worry about that. Just go out there and win games. Yeah, like they can't go into games yeah. thinking about like, oh, we got to yeah. try and finish second in the division or anything, yeah. right? Like I mean, That's a bad mentality to have as players. And I don't think they would ever have that either. No, yeah, you definitely don't want to. Like, and again, if Connor McDavid's chasing down 70 goals, you're not going to be like, hey, man, we're scratching you the last two games because yeah. we're worried about winning the division or something crazy. Uh, someone yeah. dropped in a trade proposal in the chat, and that's what I've been scrolling back trying to find. It involved Pujarvi. Um, There we go. It was from Gen X Laughs. Adam Henrique at 50% retained for Pujarvi and a first. So Henrique is having like a really strong season. He's managing to outscore the opposition at five on five, I believe, even though the Ducks are just horrendous. They're terrible. Um, Henrique makes 5.825 million for the next season as well. So this year and next year. So you retain half on that and it's 2.9 million and even wash with Pugliarvi going out the door. I don't know if you'd have to give up a first. That seems like a lot to me. He would be a decent defensive third line center. I just think, I think you can get, better target if you're moving Pugliarvi and a first than Henrik. Yeah, it might be a little bit much. I do like Henrik, though. I think that's a really interesting proposal because I think, you know, Anaheim's one of the teams the Oilers have been linked to in the Pugliarvi talks a little bit. Pat Verbeek was in Edmonton the other day watching. Yeah, there's a couple of players' names that have been thrown around. Henrik would be a really good pickup, I think, because as you mentioned, Tyler, he's kind of that defensive first guy, mm-hmm. um, sort of like what pugliarvi has been for the Oilers the yep. last couple of seasons here. Um, I, I'd probably do Pugliarvi in a first for Henrik. And the extra year of him at 2.9 million That's might be why. such a bargain that like, okay, you're giving up your first this year, but this isn't just a rental. This isn't going out and getting Jonathan Taves for four months and letting him sign in Winnipeg in July. Like it's a guy who's sticking around. That's really tempting. Uh, Switzy says on 32 thoughts, they were talking about the potential of grabbing Susie. You know, I love Carson Susie. Carson Susie is probably my dream target. I know the the ceiling maybe isn't there in a guy like that, but you're talking about a veteran who can take some tough minutes from Broberg. And I think you're going 11 and seven. This ties into my next fill in the blank question. Blank is your dream deadline defenseman for the Oilers to target. I'll say Susie because I don't think it's happening. I think Seattle holds on to him, maybe even tries to resign him. But who's your dream target? Well, it's Jacob Chikrin okay. for me. I mean, I, I think I, he's a guy that I've been, you know, as thought as the best target for the Oilers. I yep. still think stylistically he's a good fit for this team. Um, and as I kind of talked about a little bit earlier too, right? You know, who do you take out of this defensive group right now? Um, so you have to kind of subtract to add in my eyes. And I think that, um, Chikrin's the right guy for that. We are very close, Liam, to hitting 200 live viewers at a time for the first time in this show's history. And so, now a tweet. 
Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Try to get a few more in here. Uh, do you have a dream deadline target as you type up that tweet? Yeah, my dream deadline target. I like the chicken one, I suppose. I, I don't really know where I'm at with it in like the acquisition cost at the moment. Carlson would be very fun. <laughs> I don't know if I want all of that. Uh, yeah, Kale McCaw, Dr. Gonzo, that'd be great. Yeah, Rusty said that too. <laughs> he probably oh. isn't too expensive, eh? <laughs> no, yeah. I mean, what? Give up 30 first round picks? Um, Gen, just, Gen I, X and Smart Cowboy both said Matthias Ekholm. I don't like the contract there, so I'm probably not touching Ekholm. But stylistically, yeah. I agree. Ekholm would be good. Stylistically, that's probably where I would go. But also, yeah. maybe just Gavrikov is kind of the perfect piece to throw into this team right now. And He's going to cost you too much, though. Yeah, that's what. But you asked my dream. Okay. You didn't ask realistic ones. Sure. That's why people said Kale McCaw. So. <laughs> so then that's the next one. Blank is your realistic target. And I'm going to steal the name you said earlier is Dmitry Kulikov. I think the Ducks probably won't be asking for a ton. The only concern is he has an eight team, no trade list. Who knows how he viewed his time here, if he liked it here. But there is a new coach and things like that. So you'd imagine he'd be open to it. And maybe they're not on that no trade list. 2.25 million UFA at the end of the year. Guy that is comfortable playing either side of the blue line as well. You go give up your third rounder this year for Kulikov at 50% retained. I think it's Kulak 2.0. Yeah, I think so too. I think that is the style of player. Um, so I'm going to go with a style rather than like a specific player. Um, and I think it is that kind of style of defenseman, a defensive first guy who can take some of the minutes away from a guy like Roberg and mm -hmm. Bouchard. Um, it's going to be interesting to see the way the Oilers deploy their defense the rest of the season, yep. right? Because I think you can run 11 and 7 and bring a guy like Kulikov in and, and have it be really effective. We hit 200, Liam. If I had a handful of confetti, I'd throw it up in the air in celebration. Do you have a button? Okay, so just some applause. Thank you to our live studio audience. Um, TC says Scott Mayfield from the Islanders. I don't mind that. He's a Ooh, righty a predominantly, fun. but he's dirt cheap. 1.4 million, so you bring that guy in for the rest of the year? That would be a great one. Yeah, I, I wouldn't hate that at all. Uh, Wise Kyle says Edmondson or Shen, Luke Shen. I don't like Edmondson. I don't mind Luke Shen, Tyler Mulek says Orlov or Jensen from the Capitals as well as uh, potential names to look at. I yeah, got a, I got a name for you. I don't. This one isn't a target of mine. I'm just kind of seeing it swirling around. But what about the ghost? Shane Goss is fair. I think you want someone who's a bit better defensively. That's kind of yeah. what I thought too. But I just kind of seen that name fall yeah. around there. So I was curious the opinions on on that one. But does St. Louis have anyone to really offer out there d defensively? Like they. Like people keep mentioning O'Reilly, obviously. I've like been I mean, if you want to go all in, you go get Ryan O'Reilly, in my opinion. Yeah. It's going to cost you, like he's Claude Giroux levels of expensive. I think you're giving up a first and Pugliarvi and probably another pick somewhere in there based on how far you go. Seven and a half million, they got a key path, and you probably have to get a third party in the mix on this thing. He'd be very expensive, but he would make you very, very good. Oh, he'd be tremendous, right? You like, could play dry settle and McDavid be, together all the time and not skip a beat when they're off the ice. Absolutely. Like O'Reilly's been one of the best defensive centers in the game for how long now? Yeah. Like, I mean, really, and I think that's the kind of guy the Oilers need up front. Um, if they're looking to address the forward group, there's a name, a uh, defenseman, uh, Nico Mikola. They have mm. who's Nicola. real, Nicola. <laughs> you know, real strong sort of five, six defenseman, right? Yeah. Um, if the Oilers are looking for a defense first guy, I think he's the right kind of a fit. You know, he's a bigger body, blocks a ton of shots. 64 this season in 46 games. 1.9 million UFA at the end of the year. Again, that's one of those guys where you don't even need to move out salary to bring him in, which exactly. is why I like him. That's why I like Kulikov too. It's like, hey, if they retain half, you're going to squeeze them right into your lineup and not need a ton of cap gymnastics. Or if they take a contract back, mm -hmm. if it was, you know, Pugliarvi for Mikola and a third or something like that, then you're saving money to go spend and get a forward, right? You can just kind of see, and you get the asset, all that stuff. Um, it'd be interesting. Tyler Mulek says O'Reilly is what, uh, oh, well, <laughs> but yeah, and then you keep Mikola as a kicker. <laughs> keep fleecing Armstrong. Sorry, I started reading that and then uh, had to stop. Reread uh, the comments. Yeah, pre-read your comments, <laughs> folks. Broadcasting 101. Uh, Dan says, would you trade for Kuzmenko? He seems to be effective on an underachieving team. I don't think he's what they need. If they would have taken him to the pint downtown instead of Joey's Bell Tower, he would have been an Edmonton Oiler already, damn it. Fair enough. I always think about that when I see him. I was like, oh, what kind of bean? Really? I mean, he's been great, right? Yeah, he's been a almost a point of game. Like, what more can you ask for from him? He's a free agent, right? Yeah, he'll be a yeah. free agent at the end of the year. I wonder what he's going to cost. Five, six, probably. Five or six million. Yeah. Frank was saying five by five, or would a team sit there and go, we like you. We don't know if you can keep doing this one year by seven. Do you think people are going to look at Bo Horvat like that too? 
Frank, Frank, again, I'm just repeating what Frank says on DFO Live, but he says there's a team that is comfortable giving Horvat nine million bucks a year. Well, good for good for Bo Horvat. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Good for him. <laughs> uh, that's um. Okay, we do actually crazy. have to wrap this up because we are running out of time. Actually, we are pretty much out of time. We have an episode of Real Life we're recording later. Yes, Rusty asked about it. Chalmers is coming in, so let's get to our Betway bets for the day, Liam. Ding. All right, we went with two goal props today. Okay. One courtesy of our friend Gavin. Oh, oh, okay. that's spicy. <laughs> so I'll be honest, I. I don't know how Goudreau is doing at the moment. I don't know if he's hot or cold. I know he's playing in the Calgary you. Lames tonight. Um, 13 goals on the year. 13 goals. He scored his first power play goal the other day. I saw that. He scored. He's won in his last five. Streak begins tonight against the Calgary Flames. So Plus 200 is like decent. I, mean, I don't like, mind that. was a fun Revenge game? I do my Betway bets of the day. Yeah. And I post them on Oilers Nation Twitter. Goudreau is one of my bets of the day too. You, Plus 200. You got to play the narrative, baby. You got to do it. And then... I'll give Gavin's helped me out with my picks. There's a lot of rush today. So Gavin was telling me, he sat right here. I could I could give him a mic, but I'll just explain. Panarin is scored in three consecutive games okay. against Florida. And also and he's four of his last five. And they're Florida. starting Alex Lyon tonight. Now, Who is that? Never, are you Lyon? <laughs> why are you always lying? Yeah, that's a good well, that's anyway, a fine. The uh cool. yeah, Panarin plus one eighty seven. Plus he's just a really good player. Mm-hmm. So why not? May as well. I like both these. I'm taking uh, the Rangers on the money line. They're like minus 135. And I Florida is starting yeah. Alex Lyon. Um, and the Rangers should be going with Shesty tonight. So I don't see a reason for that. Uh, Carter Verhage, shot prop for the Panthers, crushed mm-hmm. it in four of his last five, hit it in five straight. Good spot. What do you like tonight? Jason Robertson over three and a half shots on goal, minus 143 on betway.com. Okay. He's a really interesting player. His home and road splits are wild. At home, he averages 4.85 shots on goal per game. On the road, he averages 3.4. They're taking on the Buffalo Sabres. Eh, they're a tire flyer at the yeah. best of times. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, that's going to be a wrap on today's edition of the show. Shout out to Betway 19+. plus. Please play responsibly. Tomorrow, it will be a Sherwood Ford Giant Game Day edition of the show. So there'll be a Sherwood Ford logo right there, which is why I do that. Uh, Star Mechanical, big love to them. Sports Closet, sportscloset.ca. I was in there on the weekend. I got like a cool jacket over here now. I'll show everyone that one tomorrow on the show. What day do we have Frank on the show this week? Thursday. Thursday. Now, you know what? We're not just going to have him on the show, Liam. He's going to be sitting right there. Right there. Right there. Frank's hey. coming to town. I, it's like, uh, what's it's like that? Santa. Santa Claus coming. Oh. Frank is Remember that scene from Elf talking about Will Ferrell when it's like, Santa. Santa's coming. <laughs> and he's Frank. freaking. Frank's coming. So Frank will be in studio on Thursday. Tomorrow it's a short for giant game day edition of the show. I think Jay will be back as well. So giddy up. Thanks to everyone who tuned in today. An unbelievable yeah. edition of the show. We'll be back tomorrow at Noon Mountain. Hope to see you then. Thank you.